There's a scene in the film Zootopia where the main character, the rookie police officer, Judy Hopps, who's a rabbit, walks into the police station on her first day of work and the tiger at the desk comments on how cute she is. Judy delicately informs the tiger that whilst it's okay for a rabbit to call another rabbit cute, it's not really okay for other animals to use the word about rabbits. And the tiger is incredibly embarrassed and apologetic about this, about using this offensive term, this microaggression. I feel like Eastern Europe at some point came to be regarded as a pejorative. Many Poles don't like it when those from Western Europe describe Poland as part of Eastern Europe. They feel offended. They almost consider it a microaggression. The writer Ed Lucas has a whole TED talk about this. I'll try to put a link to it in the description below. Now, I like Ed Lucas a lot, but I think his contribution here is unhelpful, perhaps slightly misleading, and the term Central and Eastern European just feels incredibly woolly and, and cautious. Um, I say this as someone who still uses the term myself because most of the time um, I'm scared of offending people. So when we talk about geopolitics and strategy, the term Central and Eastern Europe lacks what we'd call audacity. Um, to give a concrete example of this, let's go back to when Russia invaded Georgia in 2008. You had the presidents of Poland, Ukraine and the Baltic states all went to Tbilisi and stood on the stage in the main square with the president of Georgia as a sign of solidarity and there were fighter jets flying overhead and you almost you could almost hear the the Polish president saying where is Central Europe now um, I know he phrased it slightly differently he talked about France um, but I think that's what he meant um, Central Central Europe is Vienna it's Budapest it's Prague it's the lands that are shielded from potential military aggression by the, the Carpathians, the mountain range. Um, it's also a place that's historically more integrated with the German-speaking world, obviously in Vienna's case, but for the other countries of the former Austrian-Hungarian Empire as well. And I think Professor Bogdan Goralczyk does a really good job of explaining this in English in a podcast I've listened to him do. Again, I'll try and put a link to that in the description. Um, so the Carpathians, the Carpathians help us to understand this, uh, the history of this part of Europe. Eastern Europe begins at the Visva, perhaps slightly further west at the Odra, in which case we can say it begins in the Varta Basin. Um, historically this was always the case. The Holy Roman Empire under Charlemagne extended this far and it had its buffer areas, the eastern marches, and then its influence stopped. I'll try to talk about this more in a future video about Mieszko and so on. Um, so when I say that Poland is part of Eastern Europe, that's what I've got in mind, not the communist period. And you can think about Poland under Kazimierz the Great. Uh, Poland's historical development was always connected with the land east of the Wisła, uh, east of the Carpathians. You look at people like Sobieski, Kościuszko, Mickiewicz, Słowacki, Piłsudski. They were all born east of the borders of modern day Poland. So when we say that Poland is part of Central and Eastern Europe, it almost feels like we're maybe erasing uh, all of that, all of that history, all of that culture. So. We've talked about where Eastern Europe begins, we need to talk about where it ends, but first let's talk about the overlap it has with Northern Europe and Southern Europe. For the sake of argument, let's say that the historic port city of Gdańsk, which, was, which is where the Wisła meets the Baltic, is essentially part of Northern Europe, as are the Baltic states. There's obviously going to be some overlap here, and then in the south perhaps we can say that everywhere south of the Danube is part of Southern Europe. Historically, this was an important way of defining the boundaries of the Roman Empire, for example. So when we, what we could do is draw a line from Gdansk in the north to the mouth of the Danube at Constanta in Romania. This line goes through Warsaw, Lviv, Iasi. It goes east of the Carpathians and it's flat terrain all the way. If Poland had never been partitioned, and the history of Europe after the Industrial Revolution had developed in a different direction, this might have been a major communications corridor. Maybe it still could be in the future. Um, another line that we can draw is between St. Petersburg on the Baltic and Rostov on the Don, which is on the Black Sea. Um, George Friedman's talked about this, I think, in his interview with, with Jacek for Strategy and Future. This is the point at which the European Peninsula ends and the Eurasian heartland begins. I know that Europe is always said to end at the Urals, the mountains in Russia, um, but they're so far away from the European Peninsula that it feels like an irrelevant distinction to make. 
and we have this space between the two lines that we've drawn on the map, this area that's bounded by the Baltic in the north, the Carpathians and the Black Sea in the south, and that's Eastern Europe. I hope you enjoyed this video from Strategy in Future. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Flows and Frictions. Look forward to reading your comments and um, maybe I'll see you again in a future video. Bye. Mm -hmm.